been at fixing motorcycles. So, all right, let's um, go ahead and uh, pray. Father, we, we love you. We thank you, God, that we get to come together as your people. We thank you for your word, Lord. Uh, you tell us what to believe and how to live, Lord. And that's what the New Testament is really all about, what to believe and how to live. And that's really what we've been looking at. We've been looking at, you know, uh, based on who we are now in you, Jesus Christ, excuse me, sorry guys, based on who we are in you, Jesus Christ, now, now you call us to walk in a manner worthy of that calling. You call us to walk wisely. You call us to walk circumspectly, not foolish, wisely. And Father, you already know we all fall short, myself included, Lord. We all fall so short. If we only knew just how short time was, would it change? I don't know. It might. It might. But God, help us to look to you, Jesus, in everything. Look into you, looking past the problems, not getting caught up in the things of the day. Help us to look to you, to your word for discipline, for obedience, and help us to take it serious, Lord, and to apply it to our lives in such a way that we'll be busy serving you no matter what in a biblical way. We thank you, Father. Thank you again for your word. We just pray, Lord, that you'd bless this study to these lives here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Last week, we uh, trailed off a little bit, as you guys know. We looked at the office of apostle, right? Because we are. We're looking at order, right? We're looking at this biblical order. We're looking at this military order in rank, if you will. And uh, yeah, that's even in the church, uh, there is a military order, but also in the family, there is a military order, and so on and so forth. And that's what we're actually looking at here, and it's not by chance, it's not by chance Paul does this in this wonderful epistle uh, to the Ephesians, because he's getting ready to detail the war you are in spiritual warfare. So we trailed off. We saw that, uh, that that was a specific office, the office of apostle, and that it was designated to a specific group of men to perform specific tasks, which, by the way, are now completed, as we looked at, right? All we did was looked at the scripture. The foundation of the church is laid. Hey, do we need another foundation? No. Do we need new doctrine? No. Only if you're teaching heresies, which is the only reason why you would need the title apostle. Is this good enough? I don't need any stinking title. What I need to do is get busy telling people about Jesus, right? The foundation of the church is laid. The word of God, which we know as the New Testament, was received, declared, and written by specific apostles who were given the task. Remember, we dealt with that. And that word was confirmed that it was true and was the word of God by signs and wonders and miracles that the Holy Spirit performed through these men. And when you put it all together, it's a no wonder. We went from an Old Testament, from an Old Covenant, from an Old System to a New Testament, a New Covenant, a New System, a new way of things. And guess what? That came in power it came in signs, miracles, and wonders. And you know what? There's a whole movement today that is trying to reclaim the signs and miracles and wonders. And you know what they're doing? First thing they're doing is they're making a mockery of Jesus Christ. The second thing they're doing, as far as I see, looking like fools. Looking like fools. It's the most ridiculous thing I've ever seen. The next would be the office of prophet, of course, the fivefold ministry, which is actually fourfold, blah, 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 I won't go into it. The office of prophet, which we would come to the same conclusion biblically as we have with the office of apostle. So we're going to get to it as we get into signs of the times, if you will, signs of the end times. We're going to see how these things play into the fact that it's no doubt that we are in the end times. So I don't want to spoil too much and get too far into that. We're going to get into that soon. But we're going to continue in our passage, and we're going to work through the rest of this passage and into the armor of God. So without further ado, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to pick up in verse 22, 22, and we're going to read down through verse 33, 22 through 33. If you're there, let me get a hallelujah, praise God, amen. Amen. Hallelujah, praise God, amen. All right. Are we there? Are we there? I think we're there. Are we there? Man, I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Can I get some excitement in the room? Can we get some? Yeah. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. All right. 
You're going to need that enthusiasm. This is some tough stuff. Here we go. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Husbands, here we go. Love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her. How many husbands here, man, got this down? I'm going to put my hand over here. I'm going to put my hand over here because this is, this, this is how many wives got this down? Again, <laughs> we might have some here. So that he might, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless." So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Now, who recalls this? We're going to see this here later on. This command here was right out the gate, wasn't it? And we're going to see that right in Genesis. We see this command. And what does Paul do? What does he goes right from the oldest of commands right out the gate, and he says what? Nevertheless, or he said, this mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. And we dealt with mysteries a couple weeks ago. We'll get into that. It says, nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband, right? Easy enough, isn't it? Easy enough. So the first and foundational principle of submission is found in verse 21. Verse 21, and we dealt with that. And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, right? Subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Paul lays it out. We saw that this Military term as in rank. For instance, in dealing with military rank, today it would go something like this. Military rank is more than just who salutes whom, right? It is more than who salutes whom. Military rank is a badge of leadership, a badge of leadership. And I would almost say that they almost, it almost seems as if they got this pattern, if you will, what we know today from the Bible. From the Bible. So, introduces his teaching about specific relationships of authority and submission among Christians, and he does so in this military, if you will, idea, this military idea. And of course, he declares that every spirit-filled, here's the key, every spirit-filled Christian is to be humble, submissive Christian. Every spirit-filled Christian, back to verse 18 and on, spirit-filled, be filled with the spirit, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ, Every spirit-filled Christian is to be a humble, submissive Christian. This is the command. And of course, we're to do so out of absolute awe of Jesus Christ. Remember we dealt with that? What does it say? Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. So really the question is, do you love him? Do you love Jesus Christ? Do you really truly love Jesus Christ? Do you stand in awe and wonder of Jesus Christ? Right? When is the last time you just prayed in tears because of what Jesus Christ has done for you? When is the last time the reality of your sin hit you in such a way that you cried out to Jesus Christ in all his holiness? Right? Because he's the same always. Him and his being holy is always the same. And as we acknowledge our own faults and mistakes, uh, that's what scripture kind of does, doesn't it? kind of points out the things we need to work on in our own lives. Um, that's a good question, isn't it? When's the last time you truly just pondered on the holiness of God and just wept before him in tears because of the sinfulness of man, because of my own sinfulness, right? Every one of us has the same, right? The believer's continual reverence for God is the basis for his or her submission to other believers. That's where it all starts. Some of you may recall in the Proverbs, 
Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I love what one guy says. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge is another one. <clears throat> Those who do not have beginning have neither middle or end. And if the fear of the Lord is the beginning, those who have not the beginning have neither middle nor end. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. This is crucial in the sense that standing in awe and wonder of God is the basis for our submission to one another. The basis for our submission. If I'm not standing in awe of Jesus Christ, I'm going to be less submissive to everybody. I'm going to be less submissive in my marriage. I'm going to be less submissive all the way around because, <laughs> hey, I can get away with this. You know, hey, good stuff, right? Proverbs 1, 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The fear of the Lord is truly where it all begins. If you want to know how much someone really cares about and fears and stands in awe and wonder of Jesus Christ, it will show it will show, and we all fall short, again, not trying to preach perfectionism, but it will show in their obedience to the Bible's commands. It will show because the wives will submit to their own husbands as to the Lord. She will do so in honor of Him, regardless. Men, do we make mistakes? And what's the first thing the wife does? I told you so, you should have listened to me. Anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. We're going to get there. Again, we can make mistakes and we will make mistakes, men. How awesome is it when you make a mistake and your wife comes alongside of you? As the Kalitas says this, we're called to do with one another. Come alongside another with comfort and encouragement, right? And she comes alongside you with words of encouragement. Comfort. It's okay, honey. You know, it's all right. Or she might come alongside you and say things like this. You should have listened to me. I told you so, right? Is, how does that make you feel, men? And I'm just saying, is that submission, though? Is that what we're reading in our passage? That's rebellion, by the way, and it's sin. And it's sin. And, and you see what I mean? Common, normal, everyday responses, husband and a wife, us to one another, how much sin are we really in when we really acknowledge it and compare it to Christ and his word versus, well, at least we're not like them. Remember them, Bob? Oh, Bob, those guys. Ooh. Right? When we compare it to the perfect man, Jesus Christ, and to his word, we're, we're more in sin than we realize. And it's no wonder why we need to stand in awe and wonder of his holiness continually. That's the start, the fear of the Lord beginning of wisdom, the beginning of knowledge. That's where it all begins. So, she says, you should have listened to me. She says, I told you so. And again, that's not submission. That's being bossy. That's being pushy. And that's like a clanging cymbal. Just bam, 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 bam. Right? It's irritating. It's annoying. Knock it off. Right? That is proof that feminism has crept into the church because you see wives challenging and provoking their husbands and trying to outdo them in certain things. Feminism and pride will do this. We are far removed from the first century and the feministic mindset is corrupt. That women need to be independent and we need to outdo our men and, you know, I'm better than you. And that goes both ways. The men trying to be women and being in women's sports. And hmm, I'm reminded of the words of John there at the end. What did he say? Come, Lord Jesus, come. Wow. Right? That's encouraging. Check this out. There was a man by the name of Edward Victor Hill, E.V. Hill, who preached his wife's funeral. Preached his wife's funeral. You ready for this? All right. Dr. E.V. Hill preached his own wife's funeral in which he shared just how much of an encouraging support she was to him and his ministry. Listen to what he said. On August 29, 1955, I received my wife, a woman who only God could give, though 
Through my wife, the Lord gave me an encourager. I would like to take the time to give you several examples. One time I had invested in a service station down in Houston, and I lost my shirt. And my wife, for one of those rare moments, said to me, Edward, you don't have time for a service station. I wouldn't put any money into that, right? And I said, I want to do it. And she said, go right ahead. When I lost it, I called her and said, well, I've lost the station. And she said, all right. And when I got home, she wasn't at the door. And that was always her position to be at the door when I got home. I said, <clears throat> she's pouting because I lost this money. Right, men? Right? It's got to be. It's got to be. Right? And I said, baby, where are you? She said, I'll be out in a little bit. She finally came out and I said, now what's wrong? She said, I've been figuring up something. And I said, well, what have you been figuring? And she said, well, I figured that you don't smoke and you don't drink. And if you had smoked and drank, you would have lost as much money as you have lost in the service station. So six in one hand, half a dozen in the other. Let's forget it. Wow, how many of us would have been freaking out? Yeah. Am I wrong? Am I wrong? He says this, she could have broken me at that point. She could have said, I told you so, but she didn't. She encouraged me. Another time I went home one evening at night, and I walked in the door, and there were candles everywhere. And I said to her, what meanest thou this? You know, right? That's kind of what pastors do. They joke around. Whatever. Anyway, take it for what it's worth. She said, well, we've been married right at six months, and I just thought we would have a candlelight supper. Hey, that sounded groovy to me. But she forgot to put a candle in the bathroom. And I went to the bathroom to wash my face and turned on the lights, but no lights came on. I went into the bathroom, into the bedroom, and turned on the lights, but no lights came on. I went out and sat down. I said, baby, they turned off the lights, didn't they? She began to cry, and she said, you worked so hard, and we're trying, but it's been rough. There wasn't quite enough money to pay the light bill, and I didn't want you to know about it, so I thought we would just eat by candlelight. Wow. He said, she could have said, I've never been in this shape before. She could have said, I was reared in the home of Dr. Carruthers, her dad, and we never had our lights cut off. She could have said that. She could have broken my spirit. She could have ruined me. She could have demoralized me, but she said, let's just eat by candlelight. We'll turn the light on one day. Somehow, one way or another, we're going to get these lights on. But for now, let's just eat by candlelight. Wow. Then one week when I had received quite a few death threats, and on one night I received a notice that I would be killed the next day. I woke up thankful to be alive, but I noticed she was gone. Uh-oh. I looked out the window and my car was gone. And I went outside and finally she drove up in her robe and I said, where have you been? She said, it occurred to me that they might have put a bomb in that car last night and that if you had gotten in there, you would have blown away. So I got up and drove it. She said, it's all right. <laughs> he concludes, therefore, as far as wives are concerned, I was one of the richest men on earth. Wow. If you can't say amen, you ought to say ouch. As Vody Bauckham says, I stole that from him. But isn't it true, though? Wow. That's awesome. How awesome is that, though? That, that is a woman with the utmost respect for her husband, most likely because of her fear of the Lord. When a Christian stands in continual awe of Jesus Christ, then they will also obey his commands for our lives. When he tells us to do something, it should be a natural knee-jerk reaction. Lord, how high do you want me to jump? Whew. Praise God. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Verse 25. The husband's authority has been established. We established that. The emphasis moves to the supreme responsibility of husbands in regard to their wives, which is to love them with the same unreserved, unselfish, and sacrificial love that Jesus Christ loved for his church, the love he had for his church, for you and me. Christ gave everything he had, including his own life, for the sake of his church, and that is the standard of sacrifice 
that a husband is to have for his wife. We are to love our wives as Christ loved the church. And again, if anybody, any of us here are honest with ourselves, we would realize we fall short. We fall short. I think we miss the mark. I think we try. I really do. But I think in our trying, we miss the point. The key to all this is in the fear of Christ. The fear of Christ. The fear of the Lord. No fear of the Lord before your eyes? I know it shows. Mine as well. This isn't something you can hide. This isn't something that is hidden. It shows in who we are and what we say and what we do and how we treat each other. It shows just how much fear of the Lord we really have in our lives. <clears throat> and it's unfortunate. What a horrible witness this is to a lost and dying world, right? They need to see Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ died for his church. He gave his life unselfishly, unreservedly for the church. What does he tell us to do? Wives, look, submit to your husbands. Husbands, love your wives is the way I love the church. The question is, are we absolutely, totally dependent on God? And has your entire life and entire being become absolutely dependent on God? Everything you do. Do you wake up in the morning and go, you know, Lord, I know I'm not going to make it from here to the bathroom uh, without falling into some sort of sinful pit hole in my mind, in my heart, something, Lord. I need you now. I need you now. Or are we one of those ones with no fear whatsoever? Again, it will show it will be made clear just how much you fear the Lord by just how submissive you are to other believers, by our submission, by our conduct. And at this point, right, this is hard stuff. You might be saying, you know, who do you think you are, Pastor Bobby? You think you're so smart out there with your little nice tie and your stupid microphone, right? That's what you're thinking, right? <laughs> well, maybe not, maybe not, maybe not, right? Now you've done it, how dare you? Yeah, we're dealing with controversial, controversial stuff topics you know what i mean because it needs to be dealt with and you're right i did it yes i did it okay here we go i went against the grain right what grain the grain of the culture the grain of society right the grain of politics and popular uh american christianity today uh garbage if you will i went against all this i went against all what the world says and did what took a stand for what the bible teaches right like we're all supposed to do right yes this is hard stuff it's not easy. Why is it hard? Because it's true. Because we've been so indoctrinated and so watered down with a, a love that's not even love. You know, unconditional love is not unconditionally tolerating one another's bad behavior. It is getting back to the scriptures, the fine line, cutting it straight. What does the Bible say? God, what do I need to do? What is it you've called me to do? I want to know. I want to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we are, we are, I am bound to the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth of God's word. So help me God. So help me God. Now, I didn't make this up, and I didn't set the order. This isn't my doing. God didn't. Last time I checked, God is always right. Hey, you got a problem with this? I'm going to challenge you to go see God. <laughs> anyway, I don't boast in it. I'm just saying this is God's word. That's all we're doing. We're looking at the word of God, right? If anything has offended any of us so far, which there, some stuff is tough, right? We need to check ourselves with the scriptures. Paul says to examine yourself, you know, and we should be examining ourselves, right? But as always, you know, let's look to God's word uh, for more. Let's ask him more, right? I didn't make this up. God did this. This is God's order. It's his way of doing things, not mine. Does God take this serious? Right? This, this order of things, this biblical order of things, the men, the women, Christ is the head of the church, God is the head of Christ. Does he take this serious? Does he take serious the order of the home? The way he did it, right? Turn with me to Genesis. Chapter 2, verse 7, and then we're going to read 15 to 25. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. <clears throat> And it's crazy because you'll notice where they're attacking today when it comes to the Bible. They're attacking this right here. They're attacking the Genesis account, the first 
chapters of Genesis is their, their target for attack. The skeptic, the unbelieving world. Why? Because if you can get rid of this, then the rest of it means nothing. The rest of it is just some man chopped up type of stuff, man's ideals and opinions and things. So Genesis chapter 2, we're going to read verse 7, and then we're going to flip over to verse 15, and we're going to read there. Verse 7 says this, Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. A living being. Now turn over to verse 15 there. We're going to read through to 25. Then the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely. But from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day you eat from it you will surely die. Now, did God say here that you shall not touch it? No, he said you shall not eat from it, right? Keep that in mind. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the cattle and to the birds of the sky and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. Uh, so much for bestiality, folks. People are marrying their dogs. Yeah. yeah. That's what's going on here, right? Yeah. It is not good for man to be alone. I will make it. Why do you think that's in between there, sandwiched in between the man, right? Me and, and a helper suitable for him. And then down here, Adam, there was not found a helper suitable for him. There's a reason for that. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought it to the man. Then the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called Whoa, man. Whoa, man. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father. Whoa, what did we just read? For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Whoa, hey. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. There's more to that, but we're not going to go there right now. Clearly, God made man first. God put the man to work in the garden. Man named all the animals that the Lord God had created and then saw that there was not found a helper suitable for him. Then, of course, a deep sleep, a rib, and voila! God is awesome, huh? Whoa, man, right? A deep sleep, a rib, and bam, woman. There it is. And she was called that because she was taken out of man. And we have the first marriage relationship. And by the way, this reminds me of a story. Check this out. Adam was hanging around the Garden of Eden feeling very lonely. So God asked him, what's wrong with you? Adam said he didn't have anyone to talk to. God said that he was going to make Adam a companion and that it would be a woman. He, this pretty lady will gather food for you. She'll cook for you. And when you discover clothing, she will wash it for you. She will always agree with every decision you make. She will not nag you and will always be the first to admit she was wrong when you had a disagreement. She will praise you. She will bear your children and never ask you to get up in the middle of the night to take care of them. She will never have a headache and will freely give you love and passion whenever you need it. Adam asked God, what will a woman like this cost? God replied, an arm and a leg. Then Adam asked, what can I get for a rib? Of course, the story is history, right? I mean, once again, guys, you know, this is hard teaching, all right? We're dealing with tough stuff because we've gotten so far from biblical teaching these days that true biblical teaching comes off as hard teaching, right? You know, people don't want truth. They just want their ears tickled. How dare you tell me I'm in sin, right? Many will be offended, maybe not here, uh, because they have been in their sin for so long that it has become to them natural to be rebellious, natural to be men when you don't love your wives as the bible says which we all fall short it's sin it's disobedience to god 
we know we don't get it right, which is why we first need to be sure that we are always being continually kept filled with the Spirit, obedience to God's Word, and then subject to one another. Why? How? In the fear of Jesus Christ. Obedience to God's Word. Christ is over all things. We're just in, so in love with Him and just so in awe of Him that it becomes nature to just be what God's called us to be as His men. And then, of course, you know, women, the same thing. I've said it before, I'll say it again, bad behavior continues in a church because it is allowed to continue. Bad behavior continues because it's allowed to continue. There has to come a time when it's nipped in the bud. It just is what it is. You want God to bless you? You want Him to bless the church? You want the church to grow? You want people to come? It starts here. These are things that are for us. You want to have a good effect on this world around us? You want to be a good witness for Jesus Christ? Starts here. Starts with us. Now go over to chapter 3. Some of us same page, some of us next page over. We're going to read a nice little chunk of chapter 3 here. <clears throat> chapter 3, Genesis. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, how crafty was this serpent? Did he go to the man? He went to the woman, didn't he? He said to the woman, Indeed, as God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. The woman said to the serpent, from the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. Did God say touch it? He didn't, did he? The serpent said to the woman, you surely will not die, for God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, if God was as good as he says he is, would he keep you from enjoying everything? Why would he keep you from the joy of this? Got to be a mistake, right? Really is what the serpent is saying to the woman. There's got to be a mistake. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate and she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, <clears throat> and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loin coverings. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? Did he know where he was? Of course he did. He's God. He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked so I hid myself and he said who told you that you were naked have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat the man said the woman whom you gave me to be with she gave me from the tree and I ate then the Lord God said to the woman what is this you have done and the woman said the serpent deceived me and I ate the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, you shall bruise him on the heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, there's a lot in the Hebrew going on there. I don't have time to deal with that today. There's a ton going on right there in that one passage. Verse 17. To Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying, You shall not eat from it, cursed is the ground because of you. Now here's what's interesting. God told Adam, You shall not eat of this tree. He hadn't made the woman yet. See what I mean? In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life, the ground that is, and from the ground, but both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Here we see the fall of mankind. 
the fall of mankind, right? Back to our passage in Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5, I'm going to start at verse 21, and it says this, And be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. The husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. So husbands ought also to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his own wife loves himself. No one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church because we are members of his body. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. The two shall become one flesh. This mystery is great, but I am speaking with reference to Christ and the church. Nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. One guy says this, Wives, submit to yourselves unto your husbands. Okay, this is an instance explaining the above general rule which subjection lies in honor and reverence. Verse 33, nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself, and the wife in honor of this is an honor must see to it she respects her husband. And in obedience, they should think well of their husbands, speak becomingly to them, respectfully of them. The wife should take of the family and family affairs according to the husband's will should imitate him in what is good and bear with that which is not so obviously you know what if the dude's laying hands on you that's another story i'm not talking about that if he's very you know aggressive or if he's just mean if he's not even a christian i'm not talking about that i'm talking about biblical submission husbands and wives wives to husbands you know obviously so uh According to her husband's will, she should imitate him in what is good and bear with that which is not so agreeable. She should not curiously inquire into his business, but leave the management of it to him. She should help and assist in caring and providing for the family and should abide with him in prosperity and adversity, in sickness and in health, right? Good and and do nothing without his will and consent. And this subjection is only to her husband, not to any other nor to her children, nor to her servants, or any brought into her house. This consideration should render the subjection more easy, voluntary, and cheerful, and which is but reasonable that it should be, as may be gathered from the time, matter, and end of the woman's creation. She was made after him, out of him, and for him, and from her fall, and being first in the transgression, and from her being the weaker and inferior sex, and from the profitableness and comeliness of it, and the credit of religion requires it, that so the word of God be not blaspheme, wherefore it follows. I know that was a lot, but again, in obedience. This is a great honor to God, even Jesus Christ, and it is pleasing submission to the Holy Spirit and not grieving of the Spirit. This is good and pleasing in the Lord, for this is God's commands for the family and for his church, the body of Christ. This falls in line with the new nature we have acquired, which is in Christ. This is fitting in the Lord. Colossians 3, 18 and 19. Colossians 3, 18 and 19, a parallel passage of this. Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15 We've got a few more passages and then we'll close. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 15, like this. Likewise, 
I want women to adorn themselves with proper clothing, modestly and discreetly, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly garments, but rather by means of good works as is proper for women, making a claim to godliness, right? A woman must quietly receive instruction with entire submissiveness. But I do not allow a woman to teach or exercise authority over a man, but to remain, if you will, quiet. For it was Adam who was first created, and then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but the woman being deceived fell into transgression. But women will be preserved through the bearing of children if they continue in faith and love and sanctity with self-restraint. Women's role did not come after the fall as part of the corruption which came with the fall or as part of a cultural chauvinistic corruption of God's perfect design. Rather, God established her role as part of his original creation, right? This was part of God's original design. Verse 13, God made woman after man to be his suitable helper, all right? 1 Corinthians 11, 8 through 9, for man does not originate from woman, but woman from man, for indeed Man was not created for the woman's sake, but woman for the man's sake. Also, we saw this in our passage in Genesis as well, right? Right out the gate, right at the beginning. This is nothing new. I'm not making this up. I'm not here to be a big meanie. I'm not trying to poke people in the eye. We're submitting to the authority of Scripture, period. Bink. Actually, exclamation point. Bink. Right? That's all we're doing. One guy writes this, by nature, Eve was not suited to assume the position of ultimate responsibility. And men, when we place our women in that position, we're setting them up to be just shredded, shredded by Satan, right? By leaving Adam's protection and usurping his headship, she was vulnerable and fell, thus confirming how important it was for her to stay under the protection and leadership of her husband. And dare I say that today, it is equally as important, if not more important. Notice that the serpent did not go to Adam, but he went to Eve. The Bible says that the serpent was more crafty than any of the beasts of the field. He knew exactly where to attack. And it is the same today. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7, I'll read this for you. If you want to write these down, I would encourage you. These are all, this is all good stuff. 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 says this. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, for men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable devils, malicious gossips. We dealt with that word. Without self-control, brutal haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. Ready for this? They're out there. We know they're out there. We know they're corrupt in everything they're doing. What are they doing? Verse 6, for among them are those who enter into households of and captivate weak women weighed down with sins, led on by various impulses, always learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. In a majority of cases, and let me ask this, where are the men at when the Mormon missionaries come to the house? At at work, right? At work, and what are they doing? I'm just saying, just a thought. Fast forward to where we are today, just a thought. Women, please do not take this wrong. This is good and pleasing to God as we saw. And there is major blessing in this kind of behavior. I'm telling you, does God bless obedience? When we get back to God's way of doing things and we submit to the authority of Scripture, we do it out of love for Jesus Christ first off, and we do it because this is what he said to do. Out of obedience for him, there is much blessing with that. When a woman is submissive to her husband, then she is obeying God and God will bless her. Is it going to be easy? When a husband is loving his wife as Christ loved the church, then there is a great blessing in that because of your obedience to God. Is it going to be easy? Always. This is tough stuff. Tough stuff. But what would you rather I do? Cover it over with a layer of dirt type two or rocks and stuff and then just tell you something that makes you feel good? This should make you feel good. 
This should make us all feel good. This is great. Wives, in circumstances where the husband is not so obedient, you, will, you still maintain your obedience because God will take care of him. I promise. God will take care of him. Turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. Because again, don't take my word for it. I'm nobody. Let's listen to God's word. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. <clears throat> And again, all we've done is turn from passage to passage to passage, correct? I didn't even cover all the passages of Scripture. This is something that's repeated over and over and over and over and over again for us here in the New Testament. And you know what we're doing? We're, we're, we're fighting over, not us, so to say, the church today is fighting over who's more spiritual, who's got the greatest gifts, just like they were doing in the old day. Look at me, I can do this. And too bad you can't do that, you know, because this and that. Um, I don't see those things being repeated over and over and over again as a command for the church, do I? I see these things, though, being repeated over and over and over and over again as a command for the church. This is where it's really at. We're caught up in the, the minors, and, and that's where we major at, unfortunately. We need to get back to majoring in the majors. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 1 through 7. In the same way, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them, the husbands, that is, are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives. As they observe your chaste and respectful behavior, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding hair, wearing gold jewelry, or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is precious in the sight of God. What is it? Precious in the sight of God. That's awesome. For in this way, in former times, the holy women also, who hoped in God, used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands. Ooh, here we go. You ready for this? Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Ladies, you want to win some points? Turn to your husband and say, hey, yes, Lord. Just kidding. <laughs> Just saying, though, and you have become her children if you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. You husbands, in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way as with someone weaker since she is a woman. Show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life so that your prayers will not be hindered. Telling you, you want to be effective in your walk with Jesus. You want to be effective in your life. You want to be effective in the body of Christ and in the community around you. This is the first start, if you will. Why? Because your prayers will not be hindered, right? Are our prayers hindered at times? According to this passage here, they can be. They can be hindered. I'll tell you what, you're not walking right with the Lord. Something in the way there, you know, and again, we're all going to fall short. We're all going to miss this mark. Big time. But the, the question is, are we purposefully in our lives, purposefully to be obedient to Jesus Christ and to his word? Because that's where it all comes from. That's where it all, it's all rooted in knowing the word and being obedient to the word. But uh, next week we will deal with um, children, children fathers, and slaves and masters and yes, I say this with much confidence, the following week, uh, bring your armor, you're going to need it, because we are going to get into the armor of God, and then once we get through that, we're going to do some update stuff of what's going on in the world, we're going to do some prophecy update stuff, we're going to get into some of the stuff we've covered in more detail, and we're going to look at just what an effect it has on the world around us now, which is why this is so important. Because we as a church need to have these things in play. We're under attack, folks. It's a no wonder Paul goes right into the armor of God after covering all this stuff. Because of who you are in Jesus Christ, you're a target. You're a target. Because of our, our wanting and our, our needing to be living spirit-filled lives, because of, as we do, our subjection to one another, our husbands and wives, and, and doing these things, and our children and all this stuff, uh, you put all this together, uh, guess what? You're going to be in some serious trouble. But greater is he that is in us than is he that is in the world. It's not that you need to fear because he gives us the playbook. Do you know that you can know what he's up to? Did you know that? 
And did you know that you can prepare for what he's up to in advance so that when it comes, you can go, that, 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 what that is. I know what that is. So again, Lord willing, in a couple weeks, we will be uh, dealing with that. So let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you, God, for who you are. You're a great and mighty God and you're, you're awesome above all things. And, and Father, we just, we, we, we love you, Lord. And we get it, God, we get it. We all fall short, myself included, uh, Jesus. Help us to stand in awe and wonder of you, most of all, Jesus, in everything we do, that we would, uh, as husbands, we would love and cherish our wives as, God, as the weaker vessel, not lesser in any means, but as we saw, biblically, the weaker vessel. Lord, we know that Satan's going to come after her, and she's precious to us. They're precious to you, and God, we just, we want to be the men you've called us to be. Women, uh, we pray, Lord, that uh, even the women here be the women you've called them to be, Lord, and uh, God, there's a great blessing in that. Lord, because as we move on and we get into other stuff, we're going to see this is absolutely important because Satan gets in here, he gets into the family, he's going to have an effect on the church, which is in turn going to have effect on everything we as a church do. This is where we need to nip it in the bud. And as Christians, encourage one another, come alongside one another, help one another in this area. Men, helping the men to be men, women, helping the women to be women. And what a great and glorious and awesome uh, thing this is, God, before you, before your eyes. So help us here, Lord, to take this serious. We love you and praise you. Please bear much fruit with this study to these lives that belong to you. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. And all God's people said, amen. All right, we're going to...